Uh, so I would like to begin uh, by reading to you all a statement from one of the largest Protestant denominations in America in, uh, in 1971. Okay, it was a declaration on abortion just two years before Roe v. Wade is, is enacted, and I'll leave it to you to tell me which denomination this was. This body expresses the belief that society has a responsibility to affirm through the laws of the state a high view of the sanctity of human life, including fetal life, in order to protect those who cannot protect themselves. So far, so good, but the statement goes on. Be it further resolved, this body must work for legislation that will allow for the possibility of abortion under such conditions as rape, incest, clear evidence of fetal, uh, uh, severe fetal deformity, and carefully ascertained evidence of the likelihood of damage to the emotional or mental health of the mother. That's an ambiguous statement, right? I mean, it, it affirms on the one hand the sacredness of the unborn, but then in the same breath calls upon its members of this particular denomination to actually advocate for pro-choice policies state by state. So who was the denomination? Southern Baptist Convention. It might surprise some of you to know this, but this was the official will of the messengers of the SBC in 1971. In fact, the SBC reaffirmed a pro-choice ethic throughout the 1970s. And it was only after the conservative resurgence that the SBC shifted its course, indicating that what was at stake in the battle between liberals and conservatives was not only the recovery of orthodoxy, but a proper Christian ethic and public witness. At the time the Supreme Court legalized abortion in Roe v. Wade, the Baptist Joint Committee on Public Affairs served as the public policy and advocacy organization, not only for Southern Baptists, but other Baptist denominations as well. The committee's executive director, a guy named James Wood Jr., outlined a Baptist pro-choice ethic, ensconcing it in the language of liberty of conscience. He commended Southern Baptists for their pro-choice stance, arguing that Baptists must oppose any legislative measures to restrict abortions, quote, out of a concern that in our pluralistic society, the state should not embody into law one particular religious or moral viewpoint on which differing views are held by a substantial section of the religious and non-religious communities. Wood furthermore rooted this in the long tradition for upholding liberty of conscience and the separation of church and state. Those are his words. By this, he meant that the Baptist tradition on religious liberty uh, in Wood's hands and in the hands of Baptists uh, in the 1970s, that our long-standing distinctive on issues of conscience and religious liberty melded not merely with a pro-choice ethic, but a posture towards public theology that veiled God, his created order, and the moral precepts of scriptures from the broader society. Thus saith the Lord, or the moral demands of the natural law have no place in the public square due to the demands of pluralism and the fear of enacting any policy rooted in a comprehensive worldview that would in turn enforce a particular vision of morality on the community even if that morality sought to end the murder of unborn children. I tell you this story as a way of getting at an issue in Baptist public theology. I want to ask us this afternoon, must this be the way of the Baptist? Does our, does our commitment to religious liberty necessarily silence our voice and the demands of scriptures in the issues of public policy? Does the Baptist distinctive on freedom of conscience secularize the body politic, inhibiting a pursuit to use the legal machinery of our constitutional order to promote justice? And in fact, there are many today who accuse the Baptist tradition of doing just that. They look upon the Baptist commitment to liberty of conscience and what Baptists did in the 1970s. They look upon this and uh, they indict our tradition as one that encourages moral insanity and licentiousness through unlimited pluralism. And this has led some Baptists to look elsewhere for guidance and wisdom on issues of political and public theology. Dr. Baker talked about this in his lecture. But I want, however, to caution against that. The Baptists lost their mind in the 1970s by applying our views on religious liberty to excuse the norming of abhorrent ethical practices. And that does not mean that we must depart from our historical and theological distinctives. Upholding religious liberty and the freedom of the conscience is not mutually exclusive of a robust public theology that champions vigorous engagement in the public square. 
the Baptist theological and historical tradition has much to offer here, and it charts a more faithful way, as Jonathan Lehman stated, into the battleground of God's. The Baptist tradition nourishes conviction in the face of moral chaos, summoning us to contend for the good, the beautiful, and the true, while also championing liberty of conscience as a natural right. Yet our Baptist tradition also understood that natural rights have natural limits. And our Baptist forebears understood that without a shared ethical foundation, no nation or society could hope to last long. Our tradition, moreover, included a significant number of Baptists who rejected strict separationism while not confounding or confusing the civil and ecclesial spheres to the detriment of both civil life together and to the church. In essence, the Baptist tradition protects us from surrendering our commitments to moral erosion without delving into the tactics of Charlemagne. To show you this, I want to tell you the story of early American Baptists in the 18th century. And to be clear, the context of 18th century Baptists is far different from our own. They wrote and engaged in a context that is vastly different. A lot of water has gone under the bridge. Yet they outlined principles which help chart a path through the challenges that we face. The arguments of these figures presents us with a more stable, compelling public theology. It envisions a healthy relationship between church and state and the absolute necessity of vibrant Christianity for the health of the republic. And they contended for this, moreover, without surrendering their concern for religious liberty and disestablishment. So I'd like to outline three points, as a good Baptist must, uh, which distill significant, though not exhaustive, contours of Baptist public theology in the early American Republic. The first was their conviction regarding religious disestablishment. The second was their vision for the character of civil rulers and the relationship civil rulers must have with Christianity. And the final point captures their conviction about the public good of a vibrant, voluntaristic, faithful Christianity and the positive role Christians must play in framing the moral foundation of a community and a nation. So let's start with this first point. In in concert with writings of Baptists since the earliest years of the 1600s, Baptists in the early Republic upheld an unwavering commitment to religious liberty and the formal disestablishment of religion. And while the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution prohibited the establishment of religion at the federal level, many of the states maintained an established church upheld by compulsory religious taxes. And failure to adhere to the dictates of the established church or to pay those taxes resulted in fines, the loss of property, or imprisonment. And in almost every case, state by state, it was Baptists who were spearheading the campaign for disestablishment. Given the resistance in many states to disentangle the tentacles of the civil government from the churches, Baptists had to argue that disestablishment faithfully accorded with the natural law as well as the scriptures. They had to show how the politics of religious conformity tended towards the corruption of religion and subsequently the broader society. In his arguments against compulsory religious taxes, Caleb Blood, a minister of Shaftesbury Baptist Church in Vermont, argued that, quote, making religion a mere engine of state policy and setting up its ministers to be supported by the civil arm, their office will soon become a place of worldly honor and profit. This occasioned persons of superior advantages in life merely from pecuniary views to invade the sacred office. For blood, establishmentarian policies severed piety from religion. Indeed, he contended that civil power used to aid religion encouraged tyranny and spiritual decay rather than promoting the kind of Christianity needed for the republic to thrive. This was precisely the view of Samuel Stillman, who labored for much of his life to end persecutory policies in Massachusetts against religious dissenters. For Stillman, disestablishment and religious liberty reflected God's design with each distinct institution established by God with God-given duties and responsibilities. The church of Christ and a commonwealth, he argued, are essentially different. The one is a religious society of which Christ is the sole head and which he gathers out of the world by the dispensation of his gospel. God and God alone preserves the church by his power. The church does not need the prop or the crutch of the state for the gospel to advance. On the other hand, according to Stillman, the civil society by God's decree is, quote, designed to promote temporal interests confined to the affairs of this world. 
In this view of the matter, as Stillman articulated, the line appears to me to be fairly drawn between the things that belong to Caesar and the things that belong to God. Yet Stillman, along with Baptists at this time, did not equate disestablishment and religious liberty with the sequestering of religion from the public square, nor was religious liberty designed to secularize the body politic. And this leads to the second distinctive, namely the positive relationship Baptists envisioned between civil rulers and a free church. This relationship, in the words of Isaac Bacchus, was to be a sweet harmony. Stillman, invoking language from Isaiah 49, put it this way, as a magistrate, he should be a nursing father to the church of Christ by protecting all the peaceable members of it from injury on account of religion and by securing to them uninterrupted enjoyment of equal religious liberty. Reflective of the view of many Baptists at the time, Stillman juxtaposed religious liberty alongside the need for civil rulers who would ensure the health and stability of Christian churches, not by directly interfering or involving themselves in matters of doctrine, but by preserving their safety and liberty, to let churches be churches and Christians to live faithfully and publicly as Christians. This was why, as Isaac Bacchus argued, civil rulers ought to be men fearing God and hating covetousness, and to be terrors to evildoers. In fact, figures like Bacchus, Stillman, Blood, and a host of other Baptists in the early republic, this is going to make us maybe a little uncomfortable in here, uh, signed on to religious tests for those seeking office. Caleb Blood stated that, quote, we cannot deny but that a truly virtuous and benevolent mind is better qualified to manage the great affairs of government on which the general good so much depends. Blood argued that religious tests for office were necessary for the safety and prosperity of society. Pious and Christian rulers, he argued, have so sacred a regard for the rights and liberties of the people, both civil and religious, as that they will seek to preserve them inviolate. He qualified a statement, lacing his comments with his historic Baptist belief regarding religious disestablishment, quote, I am far from wishing to have America involved in the great error of blending the government of the church and state together. That conviction, however, in no way diminished the commitment amongst a governed people that their magistrate live godly, holy lives. Now, context is key for understanding comments like this and similar ones from Baptists in the early republic. During this time, the French Revolution left many religious and political leaders in America concerned about the moral veracity and stability of the new American Republic, hence why even some Baptists asserted the need for religious tests for office. And before dismissing this as just a condition of context, I believe that their writings contained a broader principle that animated their friendliness towards religious tests for office. They were concerned about the character of the nation's leaders. Sound character, moral fortitude, and an abundance of virtue were indispensable for the nation. And in that sense, I hope that we can join with our Baptist forebears in embracing the need for elected officials who will lead with courage and conviction rather than self-indulgence and vice. We should also, as, as Dr. Wellam has pointed out, we should also imbibe their willingness in, this, in the like manner with Martin Luther to make sure that wicked, ungodly rulers hear from the prophetic witness of the church and its ministers. And while this is a lecture about Baptists and not Martin Luther, on this point and in many other areas, Luther had a much more colorful way of putting things. The failure to stand against civil rulers who advocated injustice in Luther's mind amounted to Christians becoming, quote, lazy and worthless. For they capitulated on their obligation to tell princes and lords their sins. He wrote furthermore, quote, if you are in ministry and not willing to rebuke your civil leaders openly and publicly, go hang. There's Luther for you. <clears throat> this was a shared mindset amongst Baptists in the early republic. To modernize it a bit, in the words of Chuck Colson, a nation that does not demand high standards of character in its leaders will end up becoming a nation of barbarians. And it was a nation of barbarians that Baptists in the early republic wanted to prevent with all energy and stamina. And this leads to the final distinctive, namely the need for a vig vigorous, voluntaristic Christianity for the health of any community or nation. In this, Isaac Bacchus was particularly instructive. In a pamphlet war with the Congregationalist minister who supported religious establishment, Bacchus evinced how the Baptist concern for religious liberty coalesced with a positive vision for its place in the Republic. He wrote, I am sensible 
of the importance of religion and the utility of it to human society as Mr. Payson is. And I concur with him that the fear and reverence of God and the terrors of eternity are the most powerful restraints upon the minds of men. But I am far so, but I'm so far from thinking with him that these restraints would be broken down if equal religious liberty was established. Religion is necessary for the well-being of human society as salt is to preserve from putrefaction or as light is to direct our way and to guard against enemies, confusion, and misery. But this was secured not through establishment, but through religious liberty, so that the word of the Lord might run freely. Bacchus represented a prominent feature of Baptist public theology at his time. Jonathan Maxey, another Baptist who served as president of what became Brown University, put the matter quite bluntly. No government can support itself over a people destitute of religion. The American people, therefore, have no way to secure their liberty but by securing their religion. The statements go on and on reflecting the necessity of Christianity to the society. Again, to modernize it a bit, as Carl F. H. Henry said, quote, our generation is lost to the truth of God, to the reality of divine revelation, to the content of God's will, to the power of his redemption, and to the authority of his word. And for this loss, it is paying dearly in a swift relapse to paganism. Henry, in line with Baptists throughout our history, summoned all Christians to display and proclaim the brilliance of God's glory in the public square. The way of the Baptist cannot lead towards isolation or holy huddles. Our public theology tradition placed Christians at the center of helping frame the moral consciences of communities, neighborhoods, cities, states, and the nation. And given our present predicament, brothers and sisters, we have work to do. Whether we look to the pro-life movement teetering in a post-Roe world or the ravages of the sec sexual revolution and how it targets children, to perpetuate its sweeping moral demands. We cannot look to the Baptists of the 1970s as our sure and steady guides. On the contrary, in my brief time with you, I hope to have shown you that our Baptist tradition includes great conviction in the face of moral calamity and gospel clarity to confront any challenge. Our tradition contended not for a liberty to baptize a secular regime, but liberty that enables a more vigorous zeal to proclaim the excellencies of Christ to a lost and dying world. Our Baptist forebears did not advocate for a liberty to carve out a pitiful existence for Christians who can live in a semi-monastic lifestyle, cut off from the sufferings and cries of paganism around us, but a liberty to live as more than conquerors through him who loved us, joyfully singing the good news of the only message that can save. And as I close, it is this conviction that leads me to highlight one final characteristic of Baptist public theology that has trickled down throughout the centuries. They contended for liberty in order to create conditions more conducive to sharing the gospel. In other words, our tradition is a public theology tradition centered on seeing the lost saved. What do we see when we engage in the culture war? Who do we see? Do we see combatants? Do we see enemies? And I want to encourage us to remember that behind the culture war and all of its participants are men and women made in the image of God who will suffer forever unless they call upon the name of the Lord. And how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe of him in whom they have never heard? What do we see when we look out on the fields of the culture war? If it's military conquest, you see, I want to remind us of Dr. Aiken's message last week in chapel. Consider what our Lord saw when he looked out upon the fields. Here was the sinless one looking out on the sinners. Here was the righteous one who alone has the authority to judge and to condemn, looking out upon crowds of men and women who were by nature children of wrath. But what did Jesus see? He saw people harassed and helpless. He exuded the deepest compassion for their lost state. Does this mark us as the people of God, and does this concern for the lost being saved animate our public theology? To get very practical, have you prayed for the salvation of Dylan Mulvaney or Leah Thomas? Have you prayed for the gospel to break through abortion clinics? Have you prayed for lawmakers who utterly hate you and me and everything that we believe in to repent and believe in Jesus? Or are we more faithful at feeding and being fed by the outrage industrial complex manufactured in the factories of social media? 
Our heritage and tradition pressed into the sufferings of society, actively seeking justice and promoting righteous laws in the public square, all the while not losing the mission of eternal significance given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll close with the words of Carl F. H. Henry. God's commandments need once again to become an issue in national life. The truth of revelation, a matter of contention in every sphere of modern culture, the call, for social the call for social righteousness, a cause of trembling in every veil of injustice and indecency in the land. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is here. And we must march and sing our faith again in the public arena. Thank you very much.